So quick show of hands, how many of you want more success in your lives? Raise them high. How many of you want more happiness? Awesome. Well, I'm glad you guys came here today. Unfortunately, I can't deliver on either of those. Um, but what I do know is that when you bring like-minded people together like yourselves, great things happen. Um, what I want to talk about today is the before, uh, living a life that is crazy, career-focused, 24-7, sacrificing your relationship, jeopardizing um, everything you have just to achieve that crazy goal that you think will make you happy, to the after, this beautiful world of um, feeling like you're working with passion and that you have a good grasp of everything that you need to do within your day and that you live a balanced life. So where's Derek? How'd I do? I do okay? <laughs> Too bad. I was, I was practicing. Um, so my background has been as an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I've started five companies. Uh, as an angel, I've been an angel investor. Uh, I've invested in 23 companies, companies like Get Around, Udemy, um, uh, Unbounce, which was mentioned earlier today. Uh, I feel really blessed to uh, you know, have a really great relationship with my wife and uh, a newborn son. And what I want to kind of cover is my thoughts around why I think balance is bullshit if you're trying to do great things. Um, why extremes are dangerous if you focus on, them on, uh, focus on those extremes for too long. Um, and finally, I want to kind of share what I actually think is even more important than balance um, at the end. So my story begins, and I'm going to go way back. Uh, I grew up in a family where my mom battled the bottle and my dad was in sales, pretty much always on the road. Second oldest of four, um, I always felt like the black sheep. And at a very young age, when I was about seven or eight, uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I don't even know how they figure out an eight-year-old child has ADHD, but whatever. Um, but I kind of self-medicated by uh, building tree forts. So at a very young age, I used to convince the neighborhood kids to kind of help me build these tree forts. And when I had enough of them and the other kids wanted to play in them, I started charging them to, to jump in. Um, so I guess you could say I was in real estate at a very young age. Um, but things at home were a bit crazy for me. And... By the time I was 11, due to kind of my behavior and what I now learn is kind of my outreach for attention, um, I was removed from my home and placed into foster care. So for three years, I went from crisis centers to group homes to, to different foster parents because every time I landed somewhere as new, I would act out and they just couldn't handle me. And it was funny, one time I got placed with this new foster dad, this guy named Dave. He was a... Uh, he was about 38, never had children, you know, didn't have a wife, and just felt like he wanted to kind of give back a bit, and he got me. <laughs> I feel bad. I actually later in life found him to apologize. But, um, you know, he, instead of being like this, uh, you know, this like kind of coach, guide, father type person, he played the big brother, um, I want you to like me card, and did I ever take advantage of that? Uh, the first time, uh, I think it was the first night I show up, they introduce us, we go to the grocery store, and he goes, you know, Dan, what, what, is, what does an 11-year-old eat? And I go, uh, oh, well, at home I ate hot dogs and Pop-Tarts. And he's like looking at me, and I'm like, that's all I eat, chocolate Pop-Tarts and hot dogs, is that cool? He's like, all right, $100 worth of groceries later, <laughs> that's what we leave with. Um, I even convinced him that to bond, uh, I really liked slingshots, and uh, we could get slingshots and go to the archery place and practice targets. And so he did. He bought me slingshots with these steel beads, of all things. And uh, I think he realized it was a bad idea the day he came home. And he, he kind of came in the house and asked me why all the street lights were all busted. I was like, I don't know. There must be some other kid in the neighborhood. Um, but that didn't last long. Uh, so I moved on from Dave. And when I was 13, after a lot of counseling, uh, living in different places, I, I got more trouble, got put in, in group homes. Um, but at 13, I finally got a chance to move back home with my parents. Um, and it was at that age that um, not only did my parents finally get divorced, but I discovered drugs. And pretty much from that point, from 13 to 16, my life just spiraled out of control. I spent less time at school and more time hanging out with guys twice my age. And... Um, after, you know, years, a couple years anyways, of, you know, doing drugs, not going to school, I eventually got busted for selling drugs. I don't know why, I'm just, you know, I like, I like entrepreneurship, I guess. 
Um, I got busted for selling drugs to the daughter of the chief of police. So that landed me two years in jail. I was 16 the first time, and when I went, you know, I think everybody that gets, you know, at that point where you're just like, okay, you get a chance to reset, and I was sober, and I was in, in this place, and it's, it was probably one of the worst things that have ever happened to me. Um, it's really kind of degrading, and I promised myself I'll never come back here. And um, the day I was getting released, I remember the guard, I said, you know, he said, see you later, and I said, you'll never see me again, and he laughed. He goes, we always see you guys again. 90% of people that offend, reoffend. And I said, F you, this is the last time you're gonna see me. 11 months later, I find myself um, high on Valium and PCP in a high speed chase uh, in a small town called Sussex, New Brunswick. And obviously there was things that happened to that point for the reason why I was in it, but it got so crazy that I took a turn going so fast that I ran right through a house. And what the cops didn't know two days prior when I stole that car, because I was trying to get away because they were looking for me, I made a decision to bring a gun. Because I knew that no matter what happens, I was not going back to jail. It just was not something I wanted to do. And after running into that house, I reached over as quick as I can for my backpack, found the gun, and pulled on it, and luckily it got stuck. And the cops quickly ran up to the car, pulled the door open, and essentially grabbed me away, and I let go of the gun. And I don't know why, the next morning I woke up, and I realized that my life could have went one way, and for some reason I was still there. But I knew, for the second time, that I was never, ever going to end up back here. Unfortunately, that kind of crime um, ends up getting you sentenced to 16 months in adult jail. Essentially, at a certain age, if you do a certain type of crime, you're not going to juvie anymore, you're going to big boy jail. Ended up in like real jail, cell block stuff. And for six months, I tried to prove to the guards and to everybody else that I wanted to do better, that I didn't want to just end up kind of one of these lifers. And I went to the, the school programs and I did all the education. And eventually, after six months, um, they released me to a place called Portage. Portage is a rehab center in the middle of nowhere on a lake. And I always wondered why they placed this place in the middle of nowhere. It's because when you run away, you, nobody picks you up. They all know. If you're you know, like a 16, 17 year old kid walking the streets in the middle of nowhere, the residents all know that you're from Portage. Um, so good on them. I did 11 months there. And I learned a lot of stuff about who I was, what made me tick, why I use drugs, and eventually I graduated. And it was a changing point for me. While I was there, I discovered computers, this thing called the internet, turns out it was kind of a big deal. Maybe you guys have heard of it. Um, and I went back to high school, graduated high school, and since that moment, I've now created five companies that have turned around and generated over a thousand jobs from either companies I've invested in or the companies I've created. Um, and to this day, for 15 years, twice, sometimes three times a year, I go visit the staff and residents at Portage because I absolutely devote my life to for them giving that back to me. Um, the reason I, thanks. <laughs> the reason I tell you that story is because I do believe that in life, even no matter what you're doing from business, is you have these extremes. For many years, I was extremely focused on just being a shithead. That was how I des des described it. My dad always joked, he said, man, I just hope you figure out something you're passionate about that doesn't, that's not illegal because it's gonna be, you're gonna be a force to be reckoned with. And I was like, yeah, maybe someday, I don't know. Um, so it turns out all those dr <laughs> drug dealing skills translate into business acumen. Um, and I quickly started my first company at 18. Uh, a vacation rental site called Maritime Vacation. Now, I did make my first dollar on the internet, which in my perception, I believe that if you build a website, go public, and you can get anybody that's not your friend, your cousin, your parents to buy from you, you've gone pro, because it's hard. Um, so I did a vacation rental site. My mistake there was calling it Maritime Vacation, which is obviously the east coast of Canada, .ca. Um, so I, I got good market penetration, but it was a very small market. I then moved on and did a hosting company at 20, 
Um, lesson I learned there was don't start a company, if you, a hosting company, if you want to have any life whatsoever. 24-7 uh, type servers when you have banks as customers uh, doesn't allow you to have weekends or any social life whatsoever. Um, but I kept determined. I was like, keep going as an entrepreneur no matter what, I'd keep trying. And it wasn't until I was 24 that I started a company, Spheric Technologies, that was an enterprise portal or social kind of network software. Um, and at the same time I started that, I finally found a girl uh, that I actually fancied. Um, so in the same year when I was 24, I started a new relationship and a new company. Now, Spheric uh, was the craziest ride. That company went from nothing to 30 employees in four years, doing three and a half million in revenue. Um, I, was, I was selling to Fortune 500 companies like Procter & Gamble, Dole Foods, Johnson & Johnson. I was so young that when I went to meet with these CTOs and CEOs that I had to hire this guy named Stuart, who I called my gray hair, but he actually had no hair, um, to do the sales because nobody would buy from a 25, 26 year old. Um, but it was, it was like I was possessed. I wanted to grow by 150%. Why? Because my dad said I shouldn't. And I was like, watch. Um, no good reason other than that. I sacrificed everything. I was so much of a workaholic when I look back at those times, I would show up to parties with my laptop. Like how fun is this guy sitting there with a laptop with a beer in his head? Like nobody wanted to be my friend. They essentially disowned me. They stopped inviting me. I mean, I remember one time, uh, it was actually in Toronto. I love Enterprise because I was stuck and I needed a rental car because I had to be in Waterloo and they, they pick you up. So I was totally distracted, just super focused on my Blackberry. So it dates me a bit, right? Um, on my Blackberry and the guy goes, I'll be outside the building in an hour in a van. I was like, awesome. So I'm like doing some work, I'm like doing some calls, and then I run downstairs to the front door, I see the van, I jump in the van, and the person next to me goes, can I help you? And I was like, oh shit. Uh, I look in the rear view mirror, I'm like, okay, uh, sorry. And I was, I was blown away. Who leaves their door unlocked in a major city? And like, I'm not a small guy to be jumping in your car. Like, can I help you is not my response. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you guys have had this situation, like I was so focused on my company that I would just, I drove from Manhattan to Parsippany, New Jersey. It was an hour drive, and when I got there, I had to ask myself, who drove? Like I honestly did not remember one moment of that drive. Things were crazy. Now in 2008, May of that year, two things happened. One our company got acquired, making me a multimillionaire at the age of 28. And a few weeks later, I came home to see my wife, or fiance at the time, holding the engagement ring and dropping it on the table, walking out and saying, this is done, I didn't sign up for this, don't call me, don't try. At 28, I did it again, I fucked up, rock bottom. Here I am with all the money and resources and anything you could possibly want in the world and nobody to share it with. Not even that. The side effect of selling my company, and I didn't realize that at the time, is I actually got depressed because for the first time in a really long time, nobody cared if I got out of bed. It was ridiculous. It was so bad I had to go see a therapist. And this therapist, I was getting anxiety attacks because a lot of my identity was associated to this company and to this relationship and to this wedding that was supposed to happen in three months. And, and within a month, it was gone. And I'd have these anxiety attacks. And when I went to see this therapist, he, he made me, and I'm, I never told anybody this ever, he made me walk around with a rock in my pocket. And anytime I felt anxious, he said, squeeze the rock. And fuck, I squeeze that rock a lot. <laughs> And I was mad at myself because I'm a pretty strong-headed guy. Like I feel like I have good control over my thoughts and, and all these things. And here was my body being really upset with me. And that's when I realized, why is it that I'm so good at business and I fucking suck at relationships and other stuff? Like why is it? How can I think the way I think and create value for my customers, yet I can't figure out how to have a successful friggin' relationship? It pissed me off. So I went on a journey. Um, and for two and a half, three years, I did what I think anybody in my situation would do, is I started off by reading Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. The, <laughs> the, the mind of a woman. Uh, I don't recommend that one. Uh, and, and just thought, like, what are the things I do in business that, that create the results that I get um, 
you know, the success there. And the first thing I did is I defined who I wanted to be with. Right? And I think that's such an important step. What does success look like for you? If you think you don't have balance, what does balance mean to you? If you don't have, uh, if you don't feel passionate about your company, what would passion look like? So the first thing I did is I made a list of all the things I would want in a partner. So uh, model, uh, blonde, great smile, athletic, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, my list was, you know, focused on family, passionate about what she did. Um, would be happy for any success that I was having. Um, willing to travel, because that was another challenge, right? I spent, doing Spheric, I spent 200 days a year on the road, and my partner at the time never traveled with me. So for three years, um, so I made a list of all the things I wanted. That's step one. Uh, step two was uh, model behavior from other successful people. Did you know that out of the billionaires, let's say the top 1,000 billionaires in the world, 70% have been remarried? So I didn't focus or learn anything from them and focus only on the 30% that are still married because I want to understand what was unique about the relationship. I did something that in hindsight seems absolutely obvious, but I didn't even think of it at the time, which was find a target-rich audience of candidates. So if you're trying to find somebody that's passionate about what they do, beautiful athletics, where do they hang out? What cities do they typically live in? What activities do they do? What kind of characteristics do they have? And that led me to move to San Francisco because I figured there's entrepreneur women there. It'd be great to be in a relationship with somebody that was passionate about what they were doing as much as I, I had. And I traveled. And for three years, I was on this search, dating a little bit. But because I knew exactly who I wanted, it was really easy for me to kind of filter. Um, and then finally, one day after a conference, actually the Mesh conference in Toronto announced that I was speaking, I get a uh, tweet from, from this, this woman, this beautiful woman, saying, hey, Dan, I saw you're speaking at Mesh. Would you be open to getting coffee? I was just like checking out her Twitter profile. I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So followed her, DM'd. We set you know, kind of a mini date for, at the event to talk. And the event came, and we didn't actually get a chance to connect there, but that night we were at another event. And I watched this, this woman, this beautiful woman, go from person to person, just felt like she had so much great energy, and she was talking to everybody, and everybody loved her. And uh, I was worried that she was going to leave, and we never had a chance to talk. So I, I run over, I say, hey, um, Renee is her name. Uh, I'd really like you know, to, to get together. We didn't get a chance to talk today. She says, well, let me know next time you're in town. Maybe we can do dinner. I said, I'm actually in town for three days. Let's do dinner tomorrow. And we did. <laughs> it was a great dinner. Um, fast forward a year, she's living with me in San Francisco. Fast forward six months later, we're engaged. Last August, the 17th of August, the most amazing thing happened to me in my life. And that was the day my son Max was born. And the reason I tell you that is not because I absolutely think he's the coolest freaking dude in the world. But for the first time as an entrepreneur, I actually realized that I was creating something that would live on longer than me. Right? I was involved in this person that if I did my job right, he would go on and, and create and influence people way longer than my time on Earth. And wow, isn't that an interesting perspective around your business? Right? Not only creating a company that you're going to flip in two years, or maybe five or 10, but what if you actually thought about the business that was going to exist way past your time here on Earth? You know, I feel absolutely blessed that about a year and a half ago, after my last company, Flowtown, got acquired, that I came up with the idea for Clarity. And it wasn't like I had this epiphany and it just worked. But what Clarity is, is the easiest way for a business owner to get advice uh, over the phone to grow his business. And I didn't realize it at the beginning when I came up with this idea, but two weeks later, it hit me like a ton of bricks that I learned that lesson when I was 17 at Portage, New Brunswick. Because what I didn't tell you is the reason why that place worked, and it wasn't the first time I've been to rehab, was because every staff is an ex-drug addict. And if you've ever been in a hole so deep that you don't know how you're ever gonna get out, and you need somebody at the top telling you where to put your hands and your feet to gain those inches to maybe make it to the top, the last thing you want is somebody that showed up that just read the manual. And that's why I owe my life in business, every success I've had in business and in life 
to Portage. So to me, balance is around finding the right partner. It's around focusing on things. So I believe that if I asked anybody, it gave you 30 seconds to create three goals for the year, you'd have one goal for your personal, you'd have one goal for your health, and you'd have one goal for your career. But what nobody ever told me that it took me like a few years ago to finally learn was that there's only so much willpower you have. Every day you wake up, you only have so much willpower. It's impossible to have greatness in all three, right? Health, physical, and your career. So what I do now is every three months I cycle. I focus on one, maybe two, and I put the other one on maintenance mode. Renee, who's actually here in the back there in the blue, uh, my wife, hey Renee, she, uh, she hates when I say I put our relationship on maintenance mode. <laughs> it doesn't mean you ignore her, although some days I probably do that. Uh, it just means that instead of spending a month together as a family in Florida, you might be spending more time trying to raise a round of funding. Um, and that's what I've realized is that you can have these sprints of focused uh, intensity or extremes, but you just can't do them for too long, and you gotta make sure you take care of the other three pillars. Now, that's my philosophy on balance. I think it's bullshit. I think the best you can do is that concept where you feel fulfilled and you spend time on each one of those pillars. But the thing that makes me absolutely happy, because I think that's why people want balance, uh, that changed my life is the lesson of gratitude. Right? You can have all the balance you want in life, but if you're not grateful for the things that you have, it won't matter. And I believe, and this is the last thing I want to leave you guys with, that gratitude is the glue to happiness. Thanks for having me. Somebody sexy, tell them, hey, hey, hey.